Hello and welcome to this webinar on the explicit instruction of writing. Um, the webinar is going to be structured into the rationale, the research behind some of the strategies that I'm going to show you, the principles, the pedagogical approach, some practical strategies you can use, which are cross phase, cross domain, and also how this can fit in with your curriculum sequencing. So let's get started with a bit of context. In autumn 2020, Central South Consortium invited schools to take part in a pilot of comparative judgment. Comparative judgment is a means of assessing pupils' writing based on a huge national archive of pupils' writing on the same open-ended task and the same year group nationally. So we had both primary and secondary schools and representation from all five of the local authorities within our remit. The assessment was judged collaboratively by teachers across schools using comparative judgment. Every 10th judgment was a moderation judgment where teachers compared the work of their pupils from that of the pupils of two other schools. So this historic data meant that our schools in our region could receive standardised scores, grades and writing ages. And it reveals some really stark data, which in light of the potential regression due to the pandemic, means that the quality of writing is a really pressing discussion topic. So as you can see from the slide, out of the schools who took part, the average writing age for year three was seven years and two months against a national average of eight years. Out of the schools who took part, the average writing age for year five was eight years and five months against a national average of eight years and eight months. Out of the schools who took part, the average writing age for the inherited year sevens was nine years, seven months against a national average, which was 10 years and one month. So the comparative judgment pilot actually posed far more questions than it answered. And here are some of them. You may want to pause the video if you're watching this as a recording and discuss your initial responses with your team. So pause for thought. Do we teach writing? Oops. Do we teach writing? Did your PGCE include training in effective writing instruction? Do we assume learners will pick it up as they go? Are ideas about what constitutes effective writing universal? Do our pupils know what it means to write well? Has writing been a neglected focus in favour of reading, oracy, spelling, vocabulary? Are national expectations, the demand for extended writing, out of sync with the type of instruction our young people need? Do we perhaps jump too soon into the extended before we've mastered the basic cornerstone, the sentence? What do we think about recent debates about grammar? Does it induce fear? Does explicit grammar instruction stifle creativity? After the fronted adverbial, adverbial debate, could we be avoiding naming grammatical terms? And is there a need to name them? Are we guilty of giving vague or intangible feedback to our learners that's difficult to implement, such as add more detail? Should grammar be taught independently or taught within the content? Is grammar divorced from the content? Do our learners have enough to write about? What's the relationship between reading, experiences, cultural capital, oracy and writing? How important is working memory to the task of writing? And how can we free up working memory so that our young people are focusing on the what of their writing, not the how? Whose responsibility is writing instruction? Is it only the remit of literacy practitioners or is it something that we can and should teach across the curriculum and across phases? And then finally, how important is curriculum sequencing when considering writing instruction? Does the when and where matter? So what I hope to do today is to clear up some of the answers to these questions. I'd like to show you a few excerpts from the Comparative Judgment Archive as they illuminate lots of the common mistakes from our young people that they make in their writing. They aren't examples specifically from pupils in our region, they're taken from the National Archive, but I'm sure that lots of the mistakes that you'll see are quite familiar to us. So here's one 
with run-on sentences. So you can see that the pupil hasn't demarcated their clause using commas and full stops, and the sentences are relatively simple and unsophisticated. Let's look at this one. Just give you a few moments to read this example. So this time, you can see that even when the pupil has written in more detail, the sense is still hindered by the lack of punctuation and the lack of variation in sentence structures. So pause for thought. What feedback would you provide for this pupil? You can pause the video if you're watching retrospectively. Would we suggest surface changes, such as vary your sentence structure, or quick tips, such as add more full stops, semicolons, commas. You could say that the solution to improving this issue is to add more full stops. That would be correct. The learner does need to do this, but how do they decide how many, where and why? This can seem arbitrary and isn't a permanent resolution to the issue. Often we try to address these issues through feedback, but the feedback for the pupil to add full stops doesn't teach them the reason for the change and therefore it won't have a sustainable impact. The feedback isn't specific enough and doesn't address the root cause, so the issue will crop up again. So how do we get to this? We should be asking ourselves, how do we get to this stage with a perfect marriage of technical accuracy, fluency and sophistication? There must be a better approach which deals with both all of these things simultaneously. So this led to an extensive look at the research behind effective writing in order to find the answers to these conundrums. So here are the key sources of evidence behind the strategies I'm going to explain today. As I've mentioned, the rationale for the training comes from the no more marking pilot, the comparative judgment. Then we've got the research ed guide to literacy which underpins this CPD about the teaching of writing. The training is research informed and contains a meta study on the robust teaching of writing skills. And the good news is that a lot of the research into the cognitive science and the pedagogy in this area has given us evidence for an explicit mode of instruction which should rectify the issue. I've also taken some of the um, some influence from teaching walkthroughs and the pedagogical approach of I do, we do, you do. It doesn't actually come from walkthroughs, but I've used, um, I've used their model as, as inspiration, but it is something that's tried and tested and comes from a number of other sources as well. And then also something which is really gaining momentum at the moment, the writing revolution by Judith C. Hockman and Natalie Wex Wexler. Based on the evidence and the reading, I've assigned several principles to this writing training and I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through each one. So the first one is writing should be taught explicitly as early as possible. Writing should be taught so that the sentence has been mastered first. This means going back if our young people haven't got it. Writing should be taught explicitly using evidence based teaching for high success rates. In this case, using I do, we do, you do. Writing should be taught through subject knowledge embedded in the content, not taught in isolation or as a skill as it's or as a skill in its own right. Writing is everyone's responsibility. It mediates the curriculum and is cross phase, cross domain. The mechanics of writing enhance the other aspects of what con constitutes effective writing. And then finally, curriculum sequencing plays a vital role in the effectiveness of writing instruction. So let's look at principle one. Writing should be taught explicitly as early as possible. So there is a real issue with conflating the assignment of writing with teaching it, but they're not the same thing. We can ask learners to do lots of writing but that doesn't mean that we're helping to develop the skills needed to write. 
we can sometimes assume that it's caught and not taught. This leads to a lack of explicit instruction in logical steps building from the sentence level. And then if pupils haven't grasped the sentence level, all of those issues and deficits are compounded in their extended pieces. So we're asking them to build a house without the cornerstones, the sentence. The assumption that we learn by osmosis, they'll pick it up, is being undermined by what we're seeing nationally and what has been highlighted by the comparative judgment pilot. Reading influences learners' writing ability and complements it, but it isn't enough. There is no guarantee that exposure to text will in and of itself manifest itself in effective, creative, sophisticated grammatical writing. It will, however, expose learners to varied sentence structures and add to learners' subject knowledge, meaning they've got more to write about. They have a mutually complementary relationship, but we shouldn't count on one without the other. Spoken language, too, is inadequate, as it often doesn't offer the same variation of sentence structures. In fact, we mainly talk in fragments of sentences. These are not grammatically complete sentences and they lack sometimes a subject, a verb, sometimes both. Try recording yourself speaking in exchange and you'll be surprised how broken it is. The problems with the court not taught philosophy result in secondary school teachers assuming a level of proficiency when learners simply haven't mastered the basics. Here's a pause for thought. How many of your learners would be able to tell you what a sentence is? If you're watching this live, really think about that. Maybe write the question down for later so that you can ask your young people. If you're watching this recording with your team, pause the video and discuss it with your colleagues. Principle two, writing should be taught so that the sentence has been mastered first and this means going back if our young people haven't got it. Pupils do not know what constitutes a sentence. How can we expect pupils to write fluently, accurately and independently at length with sophistication if they don't know the fundamental first step? The feedback we provide isn't enough to correct the issues with writing. It doesn't paper over the cracks. It doesn't deal with the root cause nor explain to the pupils how to avoid these errors in future. The underlying cause of the problem is an insecure grasp of the basics of writing. They lack the prerequisite prior knowledge to get to that next stage, so we need to go back and teach it to them. To make matters worse, effective writing is a nebulous term and it's subjective. The waters can be muddied further when pupils are given tick lists, vague success criteria to shoehorn into their writing or mark schemes with vague and unachievable goals. There isn't a definitive style which is deemed effective writing either. What's effective for one purpose and text type won't be the same for another. Instead, the recipe for effective writing is, a wide, is wide ranging and variable. And we want our pupils to adapt their writing to suit the purpose, audience, format and tone required, not to produce sterile pieces which lack originality or flexibility. So we need to go back and start with the fundamentals. How can we possibly jump to vocabulary, ambitious punctuation, revising editing, sophistication and sentence structure, let alone the content if learners don't know what a sentence is? If we allow learners to plough on with paragraphs, essays or any other compositions before grasping sentences, the errors become ingrained. Pause for thought. How might an insecure grasp of what a sentence is affect your pupils? So, it's crucial to break down the learning into manageable chunks. Evidence suggests that learners need practice and repetition whilst also learning the content, not just an abstract definition of, for example, a subject and a predicate, but models ex examples practice at identification, oral rehearsal, practice applying, spaced and interleaved practice, all within the context of subject knowledge. So the operative word is obviously 
practice. They need to spend time hearing and seeing examples of full sentences and spend time telling the difference through identification and correction. Pupils need lots of practice before they can identify fragments in their own writing. So this brings me on to the next principle. Principle three, writing should be taught explicitly using evidence-based teaching for high success rates. And in this situation, I'm going to refer to the I do, we do, you do model. There are lots of fancy names for this pedagogical approach. It can be called backwards fading, worked examples or deliberate practice. I like to keep things simple and I prefer to use the same terminology that I would use with my pupils. So for the purposes of this session, I'm going to stick with I do, we do, you do. So the name is given to structured and repeated practice in which the support is gradually removed. It comes from the idea that novices, our pupils, learn more successfully from a series of worked, complete worked examples of problems or tasks than they do if they're asked to solve a problem independently, immediately or too soon. This is because the cognitive load the amount that we've got to hold in our working memory at any one point is reduced. So pupils can learn the method for improving their writing before being asked to apply it on their own. Examples and scaffolding are gradually removed, providing a good model for moving from guided to independent practice through worked examples. So how would we do this? We want our pupils to start producing their own examples. However, it's vital not to underestimate the amount of practice that this requires. Some of our pupils may not read widely and may come from homes with limited or even no access to texts. They won't have repeated exposure to a variety of types of writing. Thus, without fully scaffolded, guided and deliberate practice, it's very unlikely that pupils are going to be able to manipulate these constructions on their own. They won't have mastered the approach and won't be able to write with automaticity. The good news is that the research has given us the best bets for how to deliver effective writing instruction in order to have the most sustainable impact. It's also a method that can be used to teach almost anything from any subject for any phase. Stage one. So this would involve a fully worked example modeled uh, to introduce the method or ideas. So you'd introduce the first example you're aiming for pupils to answer. Go through the problem on the board, producing a model answer. It's so helpful if you narrate your thinking for your learners and ask metacognitive questions such as, do I need punctuation here? It's often better to model it live than produce a pre-prepared example. Present and label the examples in front of your pupils and keep narrating your thinking. What is the subject? What is the verb? Do I need a comma here? Why? You could even use a visualizer. Talk through each step again and check for pupil understanding of each one. What did I do here? Why did I choose a comma? Please be aware that pupils may need several complete examples before moving on. The second stage is a partially worked example for pupils to finish off. So this time, introduce a question, problem or example and ask pupils to finish it off. Perhaps modelling the start of a sentence or providing some ideas for the a following pattern or procedure you gave in the first worked example. Give pupils time to complete the question and then check for answers, errors or variations or misunderstandings. This checking is so crucial. It allows you to immediately correct and remediate any misconceptions so that they aren't practiced later on and become permanent or ingrained. You could also use mini whiteboards to check for understanding. Pupils should have an opportunity to receive immediate remedial feedback at the early stages so that misconceptions aren't practiced and repeated and made permanent. Stage three is a cue to start for pupil completion. Pupils should now be ready for the practice phase. Initially, set one or more questions of the same 
type as the examples, giving information so that they're cued. For example, you could signal the way that they need to begin. You can see here that we're gradually removing the scaffolding. The teacher support is gradually being faded away. The final stage is to give them an assigned cold problem to work on independently. When they're ready, set one or more questions of the same type that they have modeled, which you've modeled, sorry, where pupils have to undertake the whole of the thinking process independently. Stress the need to follow the details of the modeled examples. Follow up with self-assessment, checking for accuracy, including process questions to verify the methods have been stood, understood as well as being copied. So in summary, pupil success rates need to be high so that mistakes aren't embedded. Instructional sequences should move from teacher-led to independent practice, gradually fading out the teacher support. And during the initial stages, feedback has got to be immediate and precise to prevent embedded errors. And then practice should move from restricted drills to wider application. OK, pause for thought. Does this approach look familiar? And do we always provide pupils with enough opportunities to practice new things before we ask them to try them on their own? The next principle, principle four, is writing should be taught through the subject knowledge embedded in the content, not taught in isolation or in a skill as its own right. Pupils can't write well about what they don't know. Pupils can't apply the skills of writing easily if they're divorced from the challenging content. The rigor of the content drives the rigor of the writing instruction. This means that activities need to be interwoven into the pre-existing curriculum and woven into content in instruction. We know that writing doesn't just help writing. It helps learners to think, boosting comprehension, enhancing speaking abilities, improving organisational and study skills. This is without the impact of free and working memory, so learners are concentrating on the what, not the how, and also the creative power and the links to self-esteem and life opportunities. It's worth saying again, you can't write well about something you don't know about. So when learners write about the content they're studying, it allows them to organise, synthesise and produce their own interpretations. They process information, absorb and retain it, not to mention the vocabulary that goes with it. Writing and content knowledge are inextricably linked and cannot be divorced from each other. Well, they can, but what happens is you have a learner who can write a beautifully constructed sentence in a grammar lesson who then fails to apply it elsewhere. Teaching grammar rules independent of subject content doesn't work sustainably. This doesn't mean we shouldn't teach grammar. We need to teach grammar as part of our content instruction. And the same applies in reverse. You can't ask pupils to write extensively and creatively if they haven't got the subject knowledge to back it up because they'll run out of steam. This is why reading has a crucial influence on writing. The more pupils are exposed to challenging and rigorous texts, the more they build their cultural capital and subject knowledge, which consequently enhances all the aspects of their writing from the structure to the vocabulary. The same can be said of providing learners with multiple and varied experiences in their school life. They all feed the stimulus and act as springboards for what they can write about. Abstract rules and definitions of grammatical terms, for example, are hard to apply. Worked examples, practice, context make these tangible and explicit for pupils. So the more the pupils know, the better they can write about a topic. The better they can write about a topic, the more they're deepening their subject knowledge. Principle five, writing is everyone's responsibility. It mediates the curriculum and is cross-phase, cross-domain. Linked to the previous example, all teachers are writing teachers. It doesn't take away from subject specialism. 
writing instruction enhances it. Therefore, writing instruction works best if it's done across the curriculum. Principle six, the mechanics of writing enhance the other aspects of what constitutes effective writing. The aforementioned struggles that pupils have make, light, make sense in light of this principle. For example, if you have a pupil who doesn't know what constitutes a sentence, they're unable to write with flair or technical accuracy. In turn, that means that the pupil will not be able to write at length because their working memory is used up, it's, it's clogged up with the mechanics of writing. They don't have the automaticity which allows them to focus on the what they are writing about. They're stuck in the learning to write stage as opposed to the writing about what they have learned. So this can manifest itself in a lack of enjoyment in writing, a lack of independence, and later on the dreaded inability to write enough or write accurately enough, let alone write with any flair. And this isn't just English, but all subjects. And the issues transcend the English classroom um, and, so, and the secondary phase as well and manifest themselves in all other, area, all other curriculum areas, all other phases in which pupils are expected to express their learning in written form. Principle seven is curriculum sequencing plays a vital role in the effectiveness of writing instruction. I'm going to return to this principle after I've shown you some practical strategies because it'll make more sense later on. So this is a visual representation, it's not very scientific, sorry, of what I think are the perfect conditions for effective writing. Um, the diagram means that I cannot simply explain how to teach a sentence or what constitutes a sentence or what the concept of I do, we do, you is. I can't show you an example isolated from the content or curriculum planning. It's all got to work together. And I suppose the spider would be the pupil happily going about and sampling all of these different parts of, of, of the process, all of the whole picture together. Anyway, let me show you some practical examples. To highlight the points that I've made, I'm going to go outside of my comfort zone. So I'm a secondary school English teacher, but for the purposes of this, for one night only, I'm going to go to Key Stage 2 to teach Year 4 some science about the water cycle. So I'm going to show you a few cross-curricular, cross-phase strategies that can be used to further the understandings of the mechanics of writing, as well as the subject knowledge. I've deliberately avoided getting too bogged down with the terminology because here I want learners to be thinking about the water cycle, not the names of the grammatical terms. So you can start off by trying some verbal practice. Let's imagine learners are reaching a midpoint review of their learning on the water cycle. So they've, they've had maybe um, two or three lessons, for example. I want to ease them into ideas of complete sentences by giving them fragments that they can verbally turn into sentences. So I may say something like, take a moment to read this through, see if you can say it to yourself, what would go in the gap? If learners are adept with what constitutes a sentence, you can be even more specific and say, the subject is missing, can you make it into a full sentence? So you've got blank, shows the continuous movement of water within the earth and atmosphere. So obviously here we'd be wanting our year fours to be saying the water cycle. Or you can say the predicate is missing. Can you make it into a full sentence? The water cycle shows blank. So then you'd want it, them to do it in reverse. The answer is the continuous movement of water within the earth and atmosphere. Pupils are activating their prior knowledge, developing their critical thinking about the content and simultaneously learning what constitutes a full sentence. Remember that you don't even need to use the terms subject and predicate. You could just say what is missing to make this a full sentence, depending on where your learners are.
once your learners can do this verbally, they can then move on to doing it in their writing. So you, the instruction here is, the predicate is missing, can you make it into a full sentence? As a result of condensation, blank. You could model how to do this on the board and narrate your thinking. You could ask learners to complete it in pairs. If they're ready, they can, can, can complete it independently. So it depends on where you are in terms of the, the I do, we do, you do model. Here, you're teaching them the rules of subordination. So you've got, as a result of co condensation, so you've got that subordinate clause, whilst also teaching them the cause and effect in the water cycle, and you're also teaching them how to sequence ideas. You can also try asking pupils to rearrange jumbled sentences. This is another powerful strategy. It doesn't just teach them about the subject content or the sentence structure, it also gets them to consider their punctuation more carefully. You could say something like, can you rearrange this so that it makes a sentence about the water cycle? So again, they've got to activate their prior knowledge. They're thinking about what constitutes a sentence in having to rearrange that. Sticking with the water cycle, we can also develop their muscle for longer compositions and consider removing the dreaded recurring issue of the run-on sentence. So you can display run-on sentences with the content embedded. Ask a learner to read it aloud without pausing, or you can read it aloud together as a class. Ask learners what's wrong with it. You can do this frequently, displaying them on the board as a daily activity. Soon, they'll be able to correct them without hearing them aloud. Hopefully, soon you'll be able to correct, they'll be able to correct them in their own writing. And then also, hopefully, you'll stop seeing them in their own writing. Another versatile strategy is the use of sentence types. There are four types, which are the declarative. Now, you might want to use the pupil-friendly um, definition, which is a statement. Imperative, the pupil-friendly um, definition would be a command. Exclamatory, the pupil-friendly definition might be uses an exclamation mark to show emphasis. The interrogative, the pupil-friendly definition, which is a question. You can ask learners to develop challenging questions about what they're studying, such as can you develop three challenging questions for your partner to answer about the water cycle? Interrogatives or questions are particularly beneficial as developing questions encourages learners to think about the important features in a text. It encourages close reading and helps learners to think about the key elements of questions. Pupils are forced to activate their prior knowledge and you're getting great feedback as to what they've grasped, so what they've actually understood in the lesson. Alternatively, you could give learners the answers to the questions and they need to formulate the question. For example, give me two complete questions that result in the answer evaporation. You can differentiate and make it harder by asking them to make their questions more and more specific. For example, what is the name given to the process in the water cycle in which moisture from the sea becomes a gas? So that's obviously more cognitively complex. There are more opportunities to use sentence types. You can have learners practice distinguishing between them. For example, can you find an example of a declarative sentence, an interrogative sentence, an exclamatory sentence and an imperative sentence? Or you can use the pupil-friendly terms, such as, can you find an example of a statement? Additionally, you can ask learners to practice changing a sentence type into a different sentence type. So, for example, can you change this declarative statement into an interrogative or a question, depending on what terms you choose to use? There are even more sentence type activities, because once they grasp this, you can ask them to include the four sentence types in their own writing. For example, 
Can you write a paragraph summarising the water cycle using each of the four sentence types for effect? Please open with a problem and consider which is the most appropriate sentence type for setting up that problem. So here you're demonstrating, they have to demonstrate their knowledge, they've got to consolidate their knowledge, but they're also thinking, perhaps more importantly, about the impact of their writing on the reader. And they're also writing full sentences, so it's a real win. You could also differentiate your instruction by saying, we're going to be writing an exposition or writing an essay on the water cycle. Please provide four declarative sentences in your opening paragraph, which provide an overview of why the water cycle is so important. And then you could ask them, why, why would we use declarative sentences as opposed to um, questions? In having to explain their choice of sentence type, they need to think about their impact on the reader. You can also differentiate activities by being really specific whilst teaching them some of the functions of sentence types and where they might work well. For example, can you call your readers to action by closing your essay by imploring your readers to conserve water? So they've got to think about what sentence type would be most appropriate. Or you can say, can you close with an exclamatory sentence which demonstrates a mood of hope? So they're gaining an understanding of the function and effect of their writing, and this will help them to make appropriate choices in the future in their, their independent writing. So now we're going to look at conjunctions. There are many benefits to teaching conjunctions. It's important to explicitly teach conjunctions because our everyday talk is couched in many simple structures, and we do our learners I think a bit of a disservice if they have to tackle really rich fiction and non-fiction which uses complex sentences with conjunctions if we haven't taught them already. Other benefits including aiding pupil comprehension, encouraging close reading and familiarising learners with complex syntax. So this strategy comes directly from The Writing Revolution by Judith Hockman and Natalie Wexler. And in order to show you how it works, um, I'm going to take my examples right down to the foundation phase and we're going to learn a bit about the dinosaurs. So this strategy highlights the power of three conjunctions, because, but and so. You can give learners three sentence stems. In this case, I would do it verbally first because of the age of the learners in the foundation phase. So these stems would require them to create three complex, three separate complex sentences. The because must explain why something is true. The but must indicate a change of direction. The so tells us what happened as a result of something else. So um, cause and effect. So you can say to your learners, can you have a go at completing these sentences aloud with what we've learned about dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are extinct because dinosaurs, dinosaurs are extinct, but it could be something like we have a lot of evidence to show they existed. Um, dinosaurs are extinct, so and you could put something like humans have decided to do a lot of investigating into them. So some tips for this one. It's really good to anticipate what your learners might say first and also make them aware that so in this case, isn't used as an intensifier. For example, I love dinosaurs so much. The content drives the rigour. So if you're thinking this is too hard for little ones, um, you can change the sentence stem so that they fit the concepts that you want to teach them um, or that you want to consolidate. To look at subordinating conjunctions, we're now going to move to upper key stage two and we're going to look at a humanities lesson about the First World War. So the benefits of explicitly teaching subordinating conjunctions are that it boosts vocabulary acquisition, it allows learners to extend their responses, improves reading comprehension, and you can check learner understanding. So I've just put a few of the subordinating conjunctions here. Learners need knowledge of the role of the subordinating conjunction before they start. So, for example, 
you can tell them that the role of although is to link two contrasting ideas. So although many people know that World War I was triggered by the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, blank. So you can, you'd want them to say something like there was actually an accumulation of different factors which led to that. Here's an example using the, the subordinating conjunction when. Again, we've got to tell them that the role of the subordinating, what the role of the subordinating conjunction is first. So you can say something like, when is a subordinating conjunction, which means at the time that, I'd like you to complete this sentence now. When Germany and Austria-Hungary took control of small countries like Bosnia and Morocco, blank. And then they'd say something like the rest of the world thought they were being aggressive. This time, we could give them the role of if. If is a subordinating conjunction which introduces a possibility, I'd like you to complete this sentence now. If one country in the alliance structure were to be attacked, and then you'd want something like the other countries in the alliance would agree to defend or protect it. This is my favourite strategy, um, probably because it's low effort and high impact. For this one, we're going to go to Key Stage 4 literature, where learners are studying and inspector calls. Doesn't matter if you're not familiar with it. It's definitely, um, I would say, an example where the term sounds worse than the concept. Um, an A positive is an American term. Um, according to the writing revolution, the definition is a second noun or phrase or clause to a noun that is placed beside another noun to explain it more fully. It sounds complicated, but the examples are, are far, far easier um, once, you, once you look at them. So for example, Mr. Burling, the patriarch of the Burling household, made himself very wealthy by being a hard-headed businessman. So the bit in red there would be their, their A positive uh, clause. Perhaps because I've been teaching it this way for years, I prefer the definition parenthesis, non-essential information that the sentence would make sense without. An easy way for pupils to see if they have an A positive or parenthetical expression is to see if the sentence would make sense without it. So you can see here, when you get rid of this, it still makes sense. If a pupil has difficulty adding an A positive, they often find adding brackets much easier to define what the non-essential information is. So you've got here, Mr. Burling bracket, the patriarch of the Burling household bracket, made himself very wealthy by being a hard-headed businessman. Often they find that once they remove the brackets um, and add the commas, they have their parenthetical sentence, uh, sorry, parenthetical clause, voila. So the benefits are exponential for A positives. They improve reading comprehension. They show learners how to formulate more co complex syntax. The WJC love them. They allow for varied sentence structures, encourage careful reading. And of course, they further the subject understanding. Step one would be to give pupils examples of sentences which have A positives and ask them to identify them. So this can be done verbally first, and it may be helpful to explain how an A positive can be removed without leaving the sentence incomplete. Another tip would be to explain to learners how an A positive defines or describes a person or, or place or thing. So obviously here, Mr. Burling is being described by this, um, this parenthesis, parenthetical expression, or this A positive, depending on what you call it. You can create a mix and match activity. For example, I'll just give you a few moments to look at these sentences. Obviously, we'd like our learners to select the correct A positive which fits. So, for example, you'd want them to match Eva Smith, who we never actually meet, is significant for who she represents in society and how she catalyzes the plot. 
once they've had a go at matching a positives, you can move on, um, you can get them to move on to filling in the blanks to create their own A positives. For example, exploiting dramatic irony, blank, creates humour and satirises some of the characters. So you've got an example here, exploiting dramatic irony, using contextual factors, creates humour and satirises some of the characters. Finally, you should be able to ask your pupils to write a sentence including an A positive. So for example here, we've been studying the poem Dulce de Coram Est. Can you give me an introductory sentence about Wilfred Owen which uses an A positive? Or you can say, this is the A positive, please complete the rest of the sentence. So depending on what you want uh, to get them to be thinking about. Obviously this is far more um, cognitively complex um, deepens the thinking about grammar and also deepens the thinking about the subject content, um, which is First World War poetry. OK, I'm hoping I've managed to convince you um, of the worth of these activities, but in case I haven't, I want to show you um, several examples of these strategies and how they can drive the content even for a domain like mathematics, which isn't my forte. Um, you may think that it wouldn't work for a subject like maths. Um, I don't naturally link mathematics and grammar, but because GCSE papers require a prerequisite reading age of 15, 15, perhaps there's even more reason to link literacy and numeracy than ever. Um, and I can say, that compiling these activities deepened my subject knowledge of, um, of maths. So it'll definitely work for your learners um, in reverse. So let's see if it works for verbal practice. OK, learners, you need to fill in the blank or fill in the missing subject. Blank, distance divided by time. So you'd want them to fill in the blank. Speed is distance divided by time. So you can see that it works. You can try it for fragments as well. OK, learners, the predicate is missing or even fill in the blank, depending on um, how bogged down you want to get with the, the terminology. To work out the area, blank. So you'd want them to say something like to work out the area, multiply width by height. So it works again. Let's try it with subordination just quickly. OK, learners, please complete the sentence. If we want to find out the volume of the bath, blank. I don't actually know the, the question that I was thinking of here, but what I'm trying to get at is that the learners would have to explain their method, which you need to do for mathematics questions um, today anyway. So you can see that it works. It's giving them a springboard for adding information about how they'd work out the volume of the bath. So let's have a look at A positives in mathematics. OK, learners, please complete the sentence using an A positive. Seven blank has only two factors. So you'd want them to say something like seven, a prime number only has two factors. So again, all the strategies work no matter what the subject. You may be wondering how these activities can be woven into your current practice. Well, due to the fact that sentences are a fund fundamental element of effective writing, you'll want to give learners as many opportunities to practice as possible. So um, these opportunities could include, but aren't limited to. Um, so for example, you could give learners a do now of correcting a run on sentence, um, a starter activity, which requires them to use their prior knowledge, um, a mid-lesson pause. So imagine we're doing some uh, science um, so a mid-lesson pause in a lesson on DNA in which you ask learners to develop the question if the answer is recessive genes. Um, you could give a paired verbal activity in expressive arts in which learners need to work together to use new vocabulary um, and uh, create a sentence using a subordinating conjunction. So for example, although many people regarded his initial compositions as mediocre, Beethoven's work works remain popular. You could get them to um, develop an exit ticket in which they need to complete a because, but or so um, uh, those constructions to summarise their learning. So as you can see, 
all of these activities can be seamlessly woven into the content material to drive the thinking and the learning. This is really important. So this is the last part now. I said that we would return to curriculum sequencing. Um, it plays a vital role in how all of this works and the effectiveness of writing instruction. So pause for thought, how can we make this new knowledge stick? So if you're watching this as a pre-recorded video, pause and discuss this with your team. It's all very well teaching writing explicitly, but we need to teach it in a sustainable way so that our young people will remember. We've all been there when we thought we taught a concept beautifully, only to come back to it, expecting the knowledge to be there, and it's not. Um, so I want to show you the strand versus spiral um, curriculum slide, and I've put the, the reference there in case I get into trouble as well, because obviously it's not mine. Um, we need to look at the bigger picture. There is a risk of moving too quickly through material which won't result in a longevity of learning. Practice needs to be planned and extensive and distributed. It isn't enough to check for understanding using the same context in the same time period or, or sometimes even the same lesson. Material needs to be visited, revisited and interwoven with practice of other aspects. So the spiral curriculum, this one here, is perhaps our more traditional um, way of sequencing and involves us visiting concepts once and only once and teaching them in isolation. The strand curriculum advocates an approach in which multiple objectives are woven throughout lessons and they incrementally increase in difficulty to result in, in more proficiency and more sustainable learning. So pupils, may deal with several different topics or concepts concurrently, um, meaning that they are getting frequent opportunities to revisit and build on previous learning. So you can see here how it works for maths. You might have um, a lesson where they've got a practice addition, number families, fractions, ratios, um, so that they, they, they kind of never have to, they can never rest on their laurels. They've got to keep practicing all the different elements. So this gradual movement from closed practice, such as drills in maybe sentence types, to wider application and extended writing is favoured by the research and promotes long lasting, but more importantly, flexible knowledge so that when they actually come to apply it independently on their own, um, they're, they're able to do that. So how might this look as a rough curriculum plan? Here's one I did earlier. Um, so this is my short-term curriculum planning. Um, so again, I'm still an English teacher, but here I'm going to start um, teaching about the Romans. So I've just used Romans as an example. So lesson one, you might be teaching the Romans and you're using a positives to advance learners thinking. And again, I keep saying embedded within progressively more challenging content. It can't be divorced from the subject knowledge. Lessons two and three might be your consecutive lessons of deliberate practice using I do, we do, you do, worked examples, assigned problems, all about the Romans. Lessons four and five and six would be the completion of less restricted examples, perhaps building paragraphs in or including other elements such as ambitious vocabulary or comparing uh, the Roma Romans to, to another period in history. Whatever the class, um, whatever the material the class is currently studying so that learners are developing their writing, writing skills and deepening their, their subject knowledge. Lessons seven to nine would be a good time to, for interleave practice, mixing perhaps a positive practice with other grammatical strategies, um, mixing the Romans with, again, another period in history. Um, you could interleave the practice of A positives with the practice of subordination, or it might be punctuation such as semicolons, doesn't matter. The final stage would be when pupils have a clear conceptual understanding of the grammatical functions. And the benefit of this part here is that you should be able to give them really precise feedback 
such as, please can you make your sentence about the Romans more specific by adding an A positive. Overall, the practice must span a number of lessons and requires pupils to see variations of examples. Before we come to a close, I want to share um, just a word of caution or reassurance, depending on how you look at it, um, about terminology. There are lots of different component parts of sentences and also a lot of debate over what certain grammatical features should be called. Although we'd like our pupils to name grammatical features, certainly I would as a key stage four um, English teacher, the most important thing is that they can use and apply this knowledge in their writing. It doesn't matter what you call the component part, as long as the language is consistent and shared across the pupils and staff in your setting. For example, this could mean that any teacher should be able to say to any pupil in their feedback to use a command if this is what your setting has chosen to call it. Um, or for example, your setting might choose to call it an imperative. It needs to be consistent to avoid confusing learners. So here are some key takeaways. I started off with um, a very bleak picture and to conclude, I want us to return to some of the key issues surrounding writing with fresh eyes and to realise that lots of the problems can be addressed relatively easily with low effort, low transaction and time costs, but high impact. Pause for thought. What are the first steps for you and your teams in terms of embedding this training? Um, this is just a reminder of where I got the inspiration for the presentation from and to demonstrate that it's grounded in the evidence and research. You will have this presentation after the um, after the session as well. I've also um, created a knowledge organizer which will be available after the presentation um, so that you can show your teams. And then um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to signpost you to our professional learning on the explicit teaching of writing as it's part of a program uh, comprising of a podcast about the problems of writing and we're lucky to be joined today um, by two of the contributors to that podcast as well. Um, so if you wanted to stay for the Q&A, that would be really good. The webinar, which sets uh, you up with some cross-phase, cross-domain strategies. Um, don't forget that this recording, along with the resources and the knowledge organiser, will be made available after the event. A second webinar on the 17th of March, which you've automatically signed up to, and this will showcase effective practice with school case studies. So please get in touch if you'd like to present on behalf of your school. And then a research reflection document that you can use with your team to examine the evidence and pose the key questions to enhance your writing provision within your setting. Uh, please follow us on Twitter and sign up to the school bulletin. And also please, please keep checking the CSE website as not all of the professional learning is in the bulletin.